Hey guys, it's Mr. Kennedy back with yet another video, and this time we're going to be talking about phylogeny and systematics. Now, when we talk about systematics, that's simply the study of biology, diversity in an evolutionary context. So, it's how we study how biology, how there's so much diversity, but we're referring back to evolution. And I forgot to tell you what phylogeny is. Phylogeny is simply the evolutionary history of a species. Now, when you look at the fossil records, fossil records are going to be within the sedimentary rock or in different strata, and they help scientists figure out exactly what went on. Now, when we do dating of fossils, there's really, there's two types of dating. There's relative dating and absolute dating, or radiometric dating, as we would call it. Relative dating is whenever we dig down into soil. So let's say we were digging down into soil and we found a Mountain Dew can at this depth, and we found a Pepsi can at this depth as we were going down. Just relatively speaking, you would say if the dirt had been unearthed before, that the Pepsi can was older than the Mountain Dew can because it was further down in the earth. That's relative dating. It doesn't really give an exact age. It just kind of gives it relative to others. So now absolute dating would be what we call radiometric dating, and that is whenever we would use some type of isotope in order to determine the exact age of a fossil. We, we know what's called a half-life, and half-life is how long it takes for half the compound to decay, and we can work backwards and tell exactly how old the uh, fossil was at the time. Now, when we talk about biogeography, biogeography is the study of the past and the present distribution of the species and how they're similar. Um, at one time, you know, the, the entire continents was, I mean, there was one continent called Pangaea. And in Pangaea, we, had, we did have an extinction. We had the Permian extinction during Pangaea. But you, you have what, the first evidence of what's called geographic isolation. As these uh, plates started to move apart by continental drift or plate tectonics, then you would have fossil records found in similar places. Like in Africa and South America, you might have similar fossil, reptile fossils, showing that they once were on the same um, continent, but when it split apart, um, they diverged into different species, probably. Um, that's kind of how you look at the Australian marsupials. You know, that the Australia is uh, 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 a place where we have a lot of diversity. We have marsupials, we have... Uh, monotrums and different things there in Australia. Now, realize there were several mass extinctions, not just the one that happened for the dinosaurs. There was the Permian extinction, which you had 90% of all marine animals became extinct. Um, and then you had the Cretaceous extinction, and this is the one that's the most famous. This is the one with the dinosaurs that we most often associate with a meteor hitting the Earth, right? And, or a comet, causing the cloud of dust to go up in the atmosphere, which caused the plants to die, which caused larger animals to die. Um, now, let's look a little bit at phylogenics. Phylogenics is the tracing of the evolutionary relationships through the phylogenic, phylogenic tree. I hope you remember kings play chess on flat green stools. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. That was kings play chess on flat green stools. Um, the last two... Uh, taxes are genus and species, and Carlos Linnaeus used this as our scientific name. It's called binomial nomenclature. Um, realize that genus is always first and species is second. Our scientific name is down here at the bottom, Homo sapien. Homo is our genus, and sapien is our species, and that's how all scientific names will be written. Now, when we look at phylogenetic trees, um, sometimes we have what's called a cladistic analysis or a cladiogram, and we're going to design some of these in class, but it shows the branching of different organisms and how, and how they go. Each little branch in this cladiogram is called a clade, all right? And there are three types of cladiograms. There is the monophyletic, which means that one ancestor, there's a single ancestor, and a lot diverge from it. That is like this one over here. You can see there's one ancestor, and it diverged, and then they diverged again. That would be monophyletic. Then you have the polyphyletic. Poly means many. So you're going to have the ancestor um, here that diverges in the species, and then the ancestor here that diverges in the species. 
And <clears throat> then you got the paraphonetic. And paraphonetic means it lacks a common ancestor. And as you can see over here on the right-hand side, it's just a straight line. Uh, but those are the three uh, phylogenetic trees. Now, we're going, like I said, we're going to construct cladiograms later on. And you have to sort through homologous and analogous structures. Remember, analogous structures are not used for evolutionary evidence. Analogous structures are like a butterfly wing and a bird's wing. That doesn't mean they're related just because they have wings. Homologous structures are likenesses attributed to an ancestor, a common ancestor, and these are, are used. Now, a lot of times you'll get uh, confusion whenever you deal with convergent evolution. Remember, convergent evolution is when organisms look similar because they're in the same environment, such as in the desert. If you think of an animal in the desert, you would think probably brown, nocturnal, conserves water. Uh, an animal in Alaska, you would think is white, uh, having some type of fur. That's a convergent evolution. Divergent evolution, remember, is like Darwin's finches. All right, and this is just an example of a cladiogram, and you can see how it works. Um, you got your common ancestor down here at the bottom, remember who it was. And as you go up, it branches. The lancelets, and then you, the lancelets do not have a ver vertebrae column. A vertebral column is what all these other five have. And then you go up and the, the lamp rays here, and then all the rest of them have jaws. Then the tuna, then all the rest of these have four legs. Then you have uh, the salamander, and these two have ambionic eggs. Then you have the turtle, and then you have the leopard who only has hair. So that's how you read a cladiogram, and you can see how it was sorted out. You're going to have to be able to take data like this on the right, left, and change it to a cladiogram. So make sure you can do that. All right, guys, I hope this gives you a brief overview of phylogenics, and I will definitely talk to you soon.